Hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Fran Thorne, for anyone who doesn't know me, which could be most of you. Um, I'm the former secretary of several Victorian government departments. I'm also a former advisor in a consultancy capacity to many governments across Australia and in New Zealand and Hong Kong. Uh, in the course of my career, I've had a particular interest in system design and governance and as part of that in regulation as part of system design. So I was delighted to be invited to facilitate today's webinar on inside or outside. It's my privilege to introduce our two um, amazing and highly experienced speakers. Um, I'll have to do this quickly because they've both got very long CVs. First off, uh, introducing Professor Peter Shergold, AC, who was a senior leader in the Australian Public Service for two decades, ending as Australia's most senior public servant, Secretary of the Department of, the Prime, of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Since leaving the APS in 2008, he's been a Chancellor of Western Sydney University, the Coordinator General for Refugee Resettlement in New South Wales, Chair of the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation, CEO and now Chair of the Centre for Social Impact and serves Western Australian, Victorian and Queensland state governments. He's also uh, been on the board of, of Australia for UNHCR. Uh, and turning now to Graham Samuel. Graham Samuel AC is a professorial fellow in the Mel Monash Business School and the Monash School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine. He's been president of the National Competition Council, chairman of the ACCC and associate member of ACMA. Amongst many other roles, he is currently conducting a major review of the Commonwealth Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. As Elizabeth Knight of Fairfax has written following Graham's participation in, cap in the capability review of the CBA and APRA, no one will ever die wondering what Graham Samuel really thinks. That could probably be said about everyone uh, on the webinar today. This is an incredibly interesting topic. Um, and I imagine you're all agog to hear from um, our participants, our speakers, um, on their thoughts around uh, the inside outside question for regulators and the issues of independence and trustworthiness when it comes to regulatory activity. And our uh, two panelists, if I can call you that, um, are incredibly well um, experienced um, uh, to speak on this, and I know from them will have lots of opinions. So thank you, Graham and Peter. So starting up, I'm going to start us off on uh, what I think gets to the core of the issue we're dealing with today, which is that there is a predisposition in commentators on regulation today and probably for hmm, as long as I can remember, as long as I've been working anyhow, um, that the independence of the regulator should be the default mode. Um, on the other hand, there are, and by default mode, what they mean there is that they're not directly subject to the control, political control, control particularly of an individual minister. On the other hand, there are many, many regulators, and I'm assuming that many who are participating today, who actually work as regulators within departments. And as a former secretary of a health department, I have been an Uber regulator. Um, and obviously, uh, in our times, we have seen times where that's worked well and where it may not have worked as well. So I'm going to turn to Peter and Graham. First to you, Peter. What makes for robust regulatory independence? So what are the features of a regulatory regime that ensures independent and disinterested judgment, judgment making, free of suasion, whether it's political or from other interests? Because it's not just politicians who may seek to influence a regulator. And I think Graham in particular will have felt that pressure. So Peter. Um, look, I think it's a really in interesting question. I uh, live my life now where most of my life I am subject to regulators. So uh, I chair Opal Aged Care. And of course, we've got a new regulator, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. I, uh, ch I'm the Chancellor of a University and you've got TEXA. Um, Interestingly, I also chair a disability employment uh, provider called Job Life, and there you've got a departmental regulator. And then on the other side, of course, in New South Wales, I now chair the Education Standards Authority, 
which is a regulator. And uh, I have to say, from all my experience, it's really either or, and it doesn't matter whether you sit in the department or outside the department. Um, I noticed on the Slido, a word I'd never heard before, on the Slido, I think about 70% thought that the authorising legislation was the most important thing. And I've got to agree with that because every independent regulator has different legislation and the degree of their independence and the degree of their other functions it is different. And that's why I think people are right. The legislation is important. I don't think the fact that you are in a department necessarily means you're less independent than if you're outside. And I suppose alongside independence, what a regulator wants is influence. And the fact that you have statutory power doesn't necessarily mean you have um, influence. I think the default position is for a variety of reasons that a regulator sits better with citizens, sits better with those that are regulated, if it seems to be at arm's length uh, from government. But that's not impossible in the department. When I was secretary in uh, Department of Employment and I ran the job network, I was in charge of the you know, second employment contract, which was highly political but I had been delegated that role. I sat there doing it with a probity advisor and probably, you know, the decision I took there as a departmental regulator was probably more controversial than any decision I've ever taken as an independent regulator. So just whether you're in or outside the department, I think is too simple a question. OK, uh, and Graham, what your views on this question? Well, Peter's almost summed up my views in, in this sense. We've got to understand what we expect. Um, and there will be some regulators uh, that by their legislation or by whatever government has stipulated are intended to be uh, totally independent. And you know, if we take some of the um, existing regulators we have like uh, in the corporate area, um, ASIC, uh, the uh, Australian Securities Investment Commission, the ACCC, the Competition Commission, um, uh, APRA, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, they're intended to be independent uh, and yet their primary role is one of enforcement and enforcement regulators need to be independent of um, uh, government or ministerial direction uh, otherwise you get into what i call the trumpsian type concept of um uh, yeah well we'll prosecute him if, if it suits but we won't prosecute her if it doesn't and um yeah we'll commute to sentences and all those sorts of issues so yeah, that, that, and that gives you, um, that can give the aura or the perception of um, not only influence, but in the end, at the worst point, of corruption, uh, of, an, of, of enforcement. So let me put aside the enforcement regulator, where I think independence is really important, to more the administrative regulator, that is the regulator of ongoing activities, where it's going to depend entirely um, on the expectation created by the enabling legislation and in some cases it will be that the regulator is expected to carry out the mandate of the government uh, and it, it may be that mandate will change uh, from time to time and the expectation then it should not be one of independence uh, although some will claim that independence ought to be there because they want to see a different role they want to see a different policy setting a different policy outcome to potentially that that the the regulator is is administering uh, on the basis that the administrator is carrying out the or the regulator is carrying out the uh, the wishes of government. So that, that that's where it, it it changes. Now here you get to your real problem, because whether you can be inside a department or outside a department as an inter, a so-called independent regulator, um, you 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 can still be subject to influence if the leadership of the regulatory organisation has that culture. Um, has has that um, what's the word? Has that inclination to be influenced by by government, and that can occur for a whole range of reasons. Um, <clears throat> it, it, interestingly, I was I was reading a, a, a very interesting article just in the Australian newspaper this morning about the interaction between the current finance minister Matthias Gorman and um, uh, Greg Metcraft, the former uh, chair of ASIC, and the suggestions there that 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 um, the regulator was perhaps going outside his remit, was dealing in policy areas, 
um, at one stage stated, I think that uh, regarded um, he regarded Australia as being the the centre of of um, white collar crime or something to that effect, and then withdrew that you know at a later um, you know, presentation to a, a you know a, a, a House or a Senate committee. You know, they're the sort of things where the regulator can suffer and the system can suffer because there's a, a, a uh, th th there's an approach that's being adopted that says I'm going to get into the policy area. It's probably not my remit to get into that area, and then I'm going to start changing my position depending upon the pressure that's brought to bear. That's where the independence can be a a, a real difficulty, and that's where the the leadership of the organisation, particularly at chair level, becomes particularly important. And I think we're going to address a bit of that a bit later on. Yeah. Um, I like your idea, Graham. Um, certainly inferred, if not actually stated that uh, we should be thinking along the lines of some kind of typology for regulators that there are um, uh, that goes with I think our general view which is that it's neither one thing or the other and there are different circumstances that apply over time so that could be a great PhD topic for someone who's listening at the moment or indeed a policy exercise um, but Peter Fred, Fred, I should just mention that by the way when 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 the um, national competition policy was being subject to review by Ian Harper and his colleagues. Um, several of us at Monash actually put a view to to that uh, or yeah to, to that review that independent regulators yeah ought to be very very constrained that you you yeah. can't have independent unelected parties um, encroaching on the policy field because policy is after all set by those that we elect to government. Um, to undertake the policy directions and the like, and that the independent regulator really ought to be confined much more to uh, the issue of compliance and enforcement. Um, that's a great point, Graham, and it leads me to the thing I wanted to pick up on that you talked, that you noted, Peter, in the poll, which was the res majority of the respondents at that point in time had nominated um, essentially the um, uh, the legislation that sits behind the regulators being probably the most important feature of regulatory structure. Yet we all know from our own experience that um, ministers are very loath to go back to parliament um, once something is set in place and uh, start changing. And legislation is very hard form. It is very hard for people to change it. So given that um, the legislation is in a particularly important way of both building in the constraint um, that you uh, mentioned there, Graham, and also um, providing the environment in which a regulator may operate as well as they could. Do you have, Peter, any ideas of how um, we can build into the whole legislative process a way that makes sure that the role of the regulator remains contemporary? Well, that's a great question. Look, I, the reason I agree with the importance of the legislation goes back almost to the typology. Uh, every regulator is different. It's not just how much power do you actually wield as a regulator and are you subject to, you know, ministerial statements of expectations and so on. But most regulators, if you look at them, have powers that go beyond regulation. Sometimes they're educational. Sometimes it is clear policy advice. Sometimes you don't. So it's what are those other powers you have? And they're not all set in the statutory legislation. And that's why I think I'm a little, perhaps a little bit different from Graham. My view in some ways is you, you start from that legislation. You know exactly what it is that you do where you are wielding, quote, independence, and what are the powers you're using, which is to give advice or to educate the sector and know what's the difference. I've seen many regulators who get those confused, and that I think is disastrous. But in some ways, you know, no matter how difficult it is to change the legislation, I think if you're a regulator and you are not alert to the political climate, small p political climate, in which you're working. Even as a compliance regulator, you may actually undermine the power that you possess. Let me take an obvious example of ASIC and APRA. You know, they're independent regulators and they're compliance. Does anyone not believe that 
there was a change in view in those regulators associated with the Financial Services Royal Commission, where, you know, it didn't take much to realise there was a change in the political wing, wind from, you know, a government that was hopeful of relatively light touch regulation to going harder with black letter law legislation, you know, the, the regulators aren't going to be enough, tough enough. Now, does anyone honestly think that the way APRA and ASIC are presently working now is not different from what three years ago? And that's because if they want to stay in there and be as they must be, able to influence, not just be independent, they need to have a sense of that environment in which they operate, which may not be reflected, of course, as you suggested, in the legislation under which they operate. Yeah. And Graham, your yeah, views? I'm sure that, Peter, um, because uh, it, you know, it seems to me that what APRA and ASIC were doing were was reacting to um, some, um, some strong criticism provided by uh, Commissioner Hayne, Ken Hayne, uh, and the criticism was, in my view, properly directed um, in, in, in that he was saying, you cannot be strong regulators if you continue to engage with your regulated community the way you're engaging with them. Mm -hmm. And so he was critical of ASIC under its former leadership, and frankly, so was I, uh, and he was critical of APRA uh, and um, our capability review of APRA was likewise critical. Um, and so that's, but, but, but that would have happened. It didn't matter, you know, when we did our capability review of APRA, I was under no directions at all from the treasurer or the prime minister or anyone in government. Uh, that was a totally independent review, but it was a review, review that said, this is what's expected of you by the community. It's always been expected of you. And you're not doing it the way that you are expected to do it. Therefore, you need to change. Ken Hayne, who, let's face it, was never subject to any direction from anyone at all, said the same thing. I'm not subject to, to direction, but I'm saying to you, these organisations have in the past failed to do what is expected of them. And, and so that goes to not so much the enabling legislation. The legislation said, in ASIC's case, if you do certain things as a director of a company, if you undertake certain activities, you are guilty of a breach of the Act. And then what Ken Hayne said was, sorry, but ASIC, you haven't brought companies to account and directors to account for failures to adhere to the law as it is stated. And your role as the, as the regulator is to ensure that you do. Uh, and in APRA's case, there were similar issues. You know, APRA had done a good job, a really good job in terms of financial stability, but there are other issues that APRA had to deal with in terms of corporate governance, the like, where, um, uh, and superannuation, where uh, the capability review said, you haven't actually done what is required, and I, Ken Hain, think you ought to be a, you ought to be doing it, and so did our capability review. So that's what happens. Let, let, let me, and, and I, I so this, it's really hard to try and just draw these distinctions, but let me take another organisation uh, uh, altogether, ACASA, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. No one, no one would expect that that organisation ought to be subject to any direction from government as to how it carries out its duties. Its duties are to ensure that civil aviation is conducted safely. And, and um, if there was any suggestion that that organisation was subject to direction from minister to go light-handed and don't worry about safety quite as much because we want to restrict the, 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 the amount of money that goes into the organisation, et cetera. Well, of course, all hell would, would, would be let loose. So you, you, you soon get to know what is expected of organisations and there will be organisations in the regulatory sphere that will be subject to government policy settings from time to time as they arise. And so, and, and that's that's appropriate, but the important thing is to have government, parliament, make it clear that this is what we expect. Now, the only other thing I just want to comment on, Peter, where I do agree with you is this. Um, regulators should be independent, but I, I remember back when I was at the ACCC um, and we were dealing with, with um, some issues and, you know, again, when we did the capability review of APRA, I said, look, look, when we do with, deal with these things, we, we need to be sensitive to political imperatives. Why? Not because we ought to change the objective. In other words, you have a, an objective which says, this is what I, I must do as a regulator. But sometimes the way you do it 
can meet political imperatives that will um, get you to the same objective without in, impugning the integrity of the organisation, but will take account of the political imperatives. So as Peter, as you have said, to make it possible for you to, for you to perform your function in the way you ought to be performing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, when you talked about regulatory failure, it made me think about um, areas of regulatory failure. Uh, and the examples you chose, Graham, were those where it was a failure to uh, actually do what the their um, framework required them to do, which was uh, to pursue people who were not living within the law. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, uh, we often see so-called regulatory failure where regulators are accused and indeed attacked for not having done something for which they never had the power. Um, and um, uh, certainly um, in the human services area, that regularly happened because people were loath to give regulators of how people act and behave that much um, power, but they would often be um, criticised and very, very unfairly and in ways that they were unable to defend themselves for not doing something which was never ever their ability to do. So it all goes back therefore to the importance of good regulatory um, design, but um, I also sometimes think we expect members of the public to have the wisdom of Solomon to understand the difference uh, between what regulators are and are not available and able to do because politically uh, it often gets expressed in a way that would lead people to believe that they have ultimate power to do everything and if somehow someone gets harmed then they have failed. So. Um, but I, I and that's like... a really important point, if I could just interrupt there. Yeah. Um, we, we encountered this many times with the ACCC. The ACCC, uh, when I was chair, and, and Rod has this, the mayor Rod Sims, who's chair of the ACCC now, has this, where there's an expectation you'll do all sorts of things. So, for example, you're expected to prevent companies from overcharging. You're expected to prevent petrol companies from overcharging, right? Now, try as I might, over all the eight years that I was there, you know, you could never persuade the public that the ACCC had no power, no power to deal with the pricing of petrol other than to ensure that there was no collusion, cartel operations occurring that was anti-competitive, right? But you couldn't persuade everyone. So everyone from Ellen Jones on, on, on radio all the way through said, useless uh, ACCC, they are not controlling the price of petrol and look how it went up because of the price cycles, et cetera, et cetera. And you had this happening all the time where now, Partly regulators can be to blame for that because they create by their own rhetoric the expectation that they're going to do things. So they jawbone, uh, they try and shame companies, right? And then you say, well, look, you've been talking about this, mate, but get on with it. You're the regulator, stop them overcharging. And then you've got to say, well, actually, I don't have the power because that's not my, I don't have any role to stop overcharging or whatever the, the case might be. Right. So, so regulators have got to be careful not to create the false expectation and even to correct the false expectation that is that may have you know, accumulated in the in the community. But in the end, sometimes, as you've said, um, people just are not prepared to listen. They just keep asking you to do things that you have no uh, power or remit to do. I, I agree with that, uh, Graham, but let's be honest. Sometimes, yes, it is the regulator and yep. often an individual who's the face of that regulator, who wants to jawbone and rather exaggerate the powers they have and then go, go. Often, of course, it is governments, uh, particularly okay. at times of crisis, that almost want to exaggerate the power that sits within a regulator. You know, the, the government, the Commonwealth government has just set up a new regulator for aged care, in part, you'd have to say, because you've got the Royal Commission into aged care now, exhibiting these problems and you know we're going to give this aged care uh, quality and safety commission a power and, and that seems good except what happened then immediately COVID-19 struck out. Now you would think that that new regulator would have the power to decide what in terms of quality and safety were going to be the conditions placed on residential aged care homes of whether they would let families in to visit their loved ones. Mm. But of course, government instantly decided, no, no, actually, that's going to be a political decision. Mm. 
So if you write up to the prime minister himself, then started to say, well, you know, aged care homes have to let more families in to visit their families. Now, it's a tricky situation, of course, because if you're an aged care provider, you're trying to protect everybody who is in your residence. And yes, you want to open it up for visitors, but it's quite a tricky situation. It is ideally one that the new regulator should address. But in fact, quickly, you know, the, the government comes over the top politically to set that framework. And that's where, the, that, that's where Peter, it's important that the regulator um, in those circumstances doesn't lend um, him or herself to that political process, that political persuasion. Um, and so it, it can it can be a problem. Um, I know on occasions that that, uh, you know, it was suggested that where government was about to make a policy announcement, that it'd be a good idea if uh, I joined the minister uh, and sometimes in, in, in one or two cases, if the ASIC chair joined the minister in the announcement. And I had to say, I'm sorry, minister, I won't do it mm. because that's lending my my organization's name and my name to your policy announcement and that's your policy you want to do that you do it right but that but don't draw the the organization in that's where the independence issue can become very very important it's um yeah. you know because ultimately people want to look upon regulators you know of the nature of those i've described the ASICs, the APRAs, the ACCC's, um reserve bank people like that and to say okay i might have a statement of expectations issued by the treasurer that's public but subject to that, I am independent and I will act in accordance with what I regard as my remit under my law um, and ultimately in the public interest. Yeah, uh, although I would apply your um, uh, uh, veto on um, appearance with politicians much more broadly um, in that I think it behoves all very senior public officials to unless it is as a natural part of their duty to avoid those situations. Um, but Peter, if I can pick up on something you mentioned earlier on, which was around the view of the public around the importance of the independence of the regulator. And I just wanted to ask you, um, either of you, if, and, but I'll start with Peter, um, if you yourself, you know, your, your view about how important it is in the minds of the public, um, and secondly, um, whether or not there's actually any research into this, uh, uh, this importance in the minds of the public. So I'll start with you, Peter. Well, on the research, I'm not sure, uh, but look, I, I do think a lot about why, why do governments and why do citizens want regulators? And I think they usually want them for to be absolutely convinced that in our system of democratic governance, the authority of the executive is being wielded with integrity, that there is no conflict of interest, that there is uh, no bias, that there is impartiality. And in many of the instances that Graham and I have been talking about, that there's no market preference. Because remember, you know, we, what a regulator isn't just doing isn't just protecting you from political interference. It's making sure that amongst those who are regulated, the institutions and organisations that are regulated, that none of those wield undue influence. So that, I think, is what citizens want. I think it's become more rather than less important. Uh, these are challenging days, I think, for democratic governance, uh, to be honest. If you look, uh, faith in dem democratic principles has significantly fallen, especially amongst the young. There is very low levels of trust in politicians here and overseas. And therefore, it seems to me both an impartial public service and, quote, independent regulators are really got a crucial role in trying to maintain and restore confidence in the way our democratic governance works. Yeah. And Graham, do you have any views about this? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, look, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. I, I, I'm not aware of any research, but but certainly um, when you when I look at it in, in terms of the regulators I've been involved with, both uh, you know, in, in terms of the capability review and then the ACCC and ACMA, um, 
you, you know, there is an expectation, I think, on the part of the public, as best as you can read it, and mostly that'll be through the media, um, that you will operate independently. Interestingly, the independence is subject to two really interesting pressures. First, the media. Yeah, the media want you to act independently, providing you act in the way that they dictate that you should act. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and that's very interesting. And so you've got to resist that pressure because populism, if you like, being popular with the media can be a, um, a, a really big problem that can lead to that damage to the, uh, to the integrity of the individual and of the institution that Peter referred to. That's really important. Um, the second one will be pressure from parliamentarians. Um, now, I remember when I was appointed as chair of the ACCC having a phone call from then treasurer Peter Costello. And one of the messages he gave me in that 10 minute phone call, he said, Graham, I've appointed you uh, for five years. He said, I want you to undertake to me something I know that you have no problem with. That is, you will never ever be subject to pressure from any parliamentarian on anything you ever do. I said, Peter, you know that, you know that, that, that that'll be the case. And that was the case. There was only twice I ever had any pressure. And in both cases, I would very quickly say, I'm sorry, Minister, I'm sorry, it wasn't Minister actually, your back benches. I'm sorry, I, 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 you know that I will not um, accept or tolerate any pressure being brought to bear in respect of any matter that we uh, yeah, may be dealing with, et cetera. And, and that's, that's the way it is. Now, you can come under enormous pressure, particularly you're dealing with high profile individuals. And you know, I had a couple that we're dealing with during the, my term at, uh, you know, as chair of the ACCC. You come under enormous pressure. And I think it is a mark of the integrity of the leader of the organisation and of the organisation itself that you carry out your duties having regard to one imperative only, the public interest. If you start having regard to private vested interests or to parliamentary um, pressures or to uh, ministerial pressures, then that integrity is gone. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Um, and I, I don't think I can let this pass without commenting on um, probably the most preeminent regulators we're all spending a lot of time thinking about at the moment, uh, which are the chief health officers of our uh, various jurisdictions who I should say I think um, are doing a fine job under incredibly difficult circumstances where they are having to exercise judgment um, around matters, uh, around an, a novel virus where the level of knowledge of it is, um, well, it's only growing over time uh, and they are doing it in the full spotlight of every other expert in the known universe. Um, as well as the media. So uh, they are, and the experience we have at the moment is a very nice example, I think, of where the, um, the perception of trust is incredibly important. Um, and the, associated with that is, you know, do we trust them to be experts? Uh, and it is quite nice to see that experts are finally back in um, vogue again. Um, I agree with that, but let me just challenge you on that, Fran, because I've been using that argument a bit. And, you know, in a time when you've got the emergence in democracies of very populist politics, um, where there's lots of fake news, where the provenance is difficult, uh, it's great to see public sector and regulatory expertise being accepted. But let's be honest here. That's not a disagreement, Peter. That's no, no, but I don't want to exaggerate this no. uh, because two ways. First of all, of course, if you look at polling, I haven't seen it in Australia, but I have seen it in the UK, Canada and the United States. For example, you still have about 30 to 35 percent of citizens believing that COVID-19 was purposely created uh, in a laboratory in China. For yeah. them. That's a third. But let's think of our own chief medical officers. Everybody says, isn't it great that governments are listening to the chief medical officers? But when the chief medical officer says something that citizens are uncomfortable with, namely that children can return to school, then they no longer want to listen to the advice of the chief medical officer. No, no, that, that is true. Um, uh, uh, and we we see that. It's, it's fascinating. Look, look, that's a really... See, I, I reckon there's three things that have come through at the moment with this current, um, uh, yeah, current crisis. The first is there are a group of experts and they have got enormous credibility and um, people are listening to them subject to, to the issue that Peter raised. Secondly, 
governments around the country have been at pains to say we are acting on the advice of the experts. Yes. Uh, that's been an important element to raise the credibility of the experts. However, as Peter properly says, um, uh, when the advice of the experts you know, goes against what some in the media or, or others you know, might like to suggest um, is, is, is appropriate, then they'll say, why are we listening to these unelected experts? <laughs> heaven's sake, we want to get leadership from government. Um, but having said all that, and they're the quirks of what we're dealing with at the moment, the uncertainties, heaven help us that we'd ever have a position that poor old Fauci has found himself in over in the United States, where if he takes a view that's different to that of um, the president, the president starts in the uh, and 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 his advisors start to try and yeah. point out how fallible he is and how the advice he gave back in February March you know, had so many mistakes attached to it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you know, uh, look, look, these experts are dealing with something that is extraordinary and unprecedented. Absolutely. And if they got it absolutely right, it would not have been extraordinary and unprecedented. Um, well, and this goes to the heart of regulators, if I may say so. Um, I remember Martin Parkinson that tra said the trouble with, you know, democracies today is that citizens, of course, want more and more services, but to pay less and less taxes. Yeah. Similarly, citizens on the whole want less regulation. There is this view, my God, we're becoming a nanny state. Everything is being controlled, except, of course, when you get an outbreak of COVID-19 or salmonella poisoning or a terrorist attack or a plane crashes, then everybody says, where was the regulator? And so that's the that's the environment in which regulators inevitably have to operate. Yes, it is. Um, and I think also our current health regulators are being um, highly adaptive as they learn more and more, which is um, an interesting and good thing to see, which leads me into our next theme, because it would be good to get into another theme before this whole thing finishes. <laughs> and um, this one I raised because of our conversations prior to today's webinar which is about the issue of what makes for good regulation. And we would always move over into what makes for a good regulator, indeed, what makes for a great regulator, and that, it, that great regulators are not necessarily easy to find. Um, and so I would like to ask both of you, and I'll swap the order this time, I'll ask you first, Graham, um, is how do we create good regulators? What makes for a good regulator as an individual, that what the individual brings to the task. Oh, golly, couldn't you ask Peter first? Um, <laughs> Peter gets time to think this time. <laughs> um, okay, you, you do, I don't think you make a good regulator. I think they are, they're there um, uh, and they're individuals. And um, the, I, I, I don't want to say this because I've been a regulator myself, but they're not that easy to find, to find the good one. So what, what, what makes them? Um, clearly, you know, it, you know, management leadership is a very important element and it's that ability to lead a group of people that are part of the, the regulatory institution uh, and to establish a culture that is appropriate for the institution, number one. Number two, a regulator who is or an individual who is absolutely inflexible in putting the public interest first, absolutely inflexible um, and, and is not able to be swayed by private vested interests, by political interests. Um, and, um, you, you know, someone once said to me, uh, you, you know, one of the reasons that people become regulators um, is because of the psychic income. That's instead of the cash income. Uh, and what's psychic income? Well, there are two descriptions of it. Psychic income is um, in the, the good description. It is that sense that you are doing something that's really useful, that's really in the public interest. That's, that's yeah, the, the good definition. The other definition of psychic income is not so good, uh, and that is um, the feeling that you are in an area where you've got power, that you can ring important people and deal with important people. In other words, you are, um, uh, in a sense, you are attracted by that. Element. Now, when that occurs, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble because that's what then leads you to sacrifice integrity, both personal and institutional integrity, in favour of the 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 psychic that yeah the poor definition of psychic income. The other things the regulators can do that can be yeah a problem um, uh, and they go rogue if they do all this is yeah for example focusing not so much on what they're required to do now, but rather focusing on what they might want to do once they finish their term of office. 
um, you know, uh, gee, I wouldn't mind that big international posting. Therefore, what I ought to do is go overseas a lot and get myself known in the international circuit um, as a result of which I may get offered a, an international posting once um, uh, you know, all this is, is, is uh, yeah, my term is over. They're the sort of things that can be a problem. Or going beyond your remit and saying, I've got some views on policy and I want to express those views on policy publicly uh, and then you can get to strife again because that may not be your role if you are there as a an enforcement regulator of the law that is currently with you. So um, the, the, they're the sort of things that can impact on, but I'll go back to what I initially said, a good regulator is a person who can manage an organisation well, and that means proper communication, has a rigid view, inflexible view about the public interest um, and says, I will lead my organisation to further the public interest in accordance with the legislation that I have here, and that cannot be swayed. Well, you see, I reckon, Graham, I'm 90% in agreement with you, but probably the 10% I'm not is the crucial, because I believe a regulator needs to have the trust and confidence of those who are being regulated. They need to understand the impartiality, they need to understand the rules of engagement, etc. But I think a regulator also needs to have the wider trust of those that are regulated. And if you fall back on statutory power in an inflexible way, then it may not work. So let me be example of this. About, I think it was 2010, 2011, a new regulator was established, TEXA, to oversight tertiary education. About 40 universities, about 140 non-university higher education providers. Now, in the first year of Texas existence, uh, the pushback from the sector was extreme. The pushback in terms of, my God, the burden of administration that's being imposed uh, upon us here is simply uh, too great and we can't see much of the value that's being added. Now, as a result of that, there was political pushback. And in fact, I was asked to be the chair of what was called the Texas Advisory Committee. So acting as that intermediary between the minister's department on the one hand and the regulator on the other. It then became the Higher Education Standards Panel. And that was obviously to try and moderate a system in which the regulator could, in a sense, recapture the support of the sector who would actually see it as beneficial to have a regulator ensuring you know, high standards, uh, particularly, of course, in terms of uh, overseas students. And in fact, I thought the regulator then responded very well, you know, started to talk about regulatory necessity, risk reflection, uh, proportionality, all those sensible things and work with the sector. Now, out of that, I don't believe that the sector has ended up less regulated than would have been the case. What you do have, though, is a sector which is much more supportive because you've got a sector that can actually see the benefits of the regulatory role played by Texa. So I don't think every time you just inflexibly apply the statutory powers you have. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, we're not even one percent in disagreement because I agree completely with you uh, and I didn't mean to imply that you inflexibly um, exercise the powers. By the way, the powers that a regulator has can vary in a whole range of ways. It's the enforcement process and there are different ways. There's right. the, the famous you know, sort of enforcement pyramid that we've got that um, uh, you know, shows the way that you do it. And, and that enforcement period sort of you know, puts litigation at the very, very peak. Um, it's the one area, the, probably the only paragraph of Ken Haynes' uh, report that I disagree with where he said the courts are so vital and it seemed to me that the courts and litigation is not necessarily the way to go. But this is the important thing. Regulators can be seduced. They can be seduced by that psychic income. And the psychic income is the power or the relationship with big business and the like. And you've got to resist, you know, you've got to resist that seduction. So that means, for example, um, and uh, this was an edict that uh, I had at the ACCC, you do not accept entertainment. You do not accept gifts. 
um, you do not um, uh, you know, engage, and this is tough, I have to say, but you don't engage socially with um, organisations that you may have to deal with um, uh, you know, as a regulator, because you want to say organisations with, with you know, senior people. It's a tough gig, but that's the only way to do it, because if you start to become too close, you become seduced. And okay. then it's difficult to do the enforcement. I'm going to interrupt here um, because we want to leave a little bit of time for questions and there are many. So I'm going to be democratic and choose the questions that got the most most upvoting uh, term, which I think is terrible. Um, uh, so uh, this is a really interesting one. Um, can any of us um, think of or be prepared to pass a comment on the differing funding models that apply to an independent regulator? And are some models better than others in your experience? Peter. I'll have a first crack while Graham thinks. Um, first of all, of course, to a significant extent, your independence is greater as a regulator if you have an independent source of revenue other than that provided by the government. Because if you think about it in extremis, the power that a government always has over uh, an independent regulator is the power of the purse. Uh, do you want a 10% efficiency dividend over the next three years, etc.? So obviously, to the extent that you've got independent sources of revenue, including sources from those you regulate in terms of paying their own costs for the regulation, then in my view, that does give you a uh, Quite a significant degree of extra uh, independence. Yep. Graham? Um, yeah, there are two or three aspects of this. The first is I'm not sure that it matters where your income, your revenue comes from, providing that you understand the independence of, of what you're doing. Um, so sometimes, you know, in some models, uh, industry funds the regulator, um, and in others, it's funded by government. The difference can be, of course, is that if government underfunds you, uh, then your regulatory capability is severely limited. And the only way you can deal with that is to actually say so publicly. You know, I, and I don't mean that you go out there and you make a issue yeah. of media release, but if it, it comes up in Senate estimates or whatever it might be, that you say, look, I just can't do all this. I just haven't got the money. I, you know, the, the, the resources are not there to, um, to do it. Um, there's an interesting thing that many people outside the regulatory environment don't appreciate, and that is if you take court proceedings and you obtain a penalty, um, a substantial financial penalty, you don't keep it. It goes into general revenue. It's not part of the regulator's income. And I, when I first sort of experienced that, I thought, well, that, that's strange. You know, surely, yeah, we won the court case. We're entitled to the revenue. And then I'm thinking, oh, no, that's a bad oh, box yes. if you took that view, because what it does is encourage you to take um, litigation or to pursue course of action based on a success. It's almost like the... Um, uh, the the uh, class action type process we have at the present time, where you sort of you get paid a share of, of your success. And I don't think that that's an appropriate model for a regulator. So yes, if you get a penalty, it ought to go into consolidated revenue as it does. Um, and then um, you know, government must determine how much is needed for you to be able to carry out your responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer on this one. Um, I am inclined to agree with Peter about having own source income, but even that is going to be constrained by how much you can raise um, and the circumstances under which you raise it. Um, and in the end, you have to uh, uh, rely on the fact that the, uh, the people or organisations that you are reg regulating on behalf of uh, will be of sufficient voice should anyone decide to clip your wings too tightly financially as occasionally happens. Now I'm going to run two questions together because I think they're both really interesting. Um, uh, and one of the, because the, the, they are, are related to each other, and the, and the first part of it is, is about the issue of regulatory capture, that where the regulator themselves um, gets captured by um, the community that they're regulating, which um, I'm sure can occur. Um, and then an associated question, uh, which is, are we, are we um, uh, confident that there are sufficient audit systems uh, or oversight of regulators to guard against regulatory failure, whether departmental or independent? 
Um, so uh, I'm happy for you guys to take those two separately or put them together because I think they are related. Um, and I'll randomly choose you, Graham, to start. Oh, blow. All right. Uh, yeah, look, regulatory capture can occur, um, and um, it soon becomes fairly obvious that it has occurred. Uh, and it's part of that seduction process I talked of before. Um, and you've got to resist it. You, you're, that, that's one of the marks of a good regulator. Um, and actually, it's a mark of a bad regulator where they don't resist it and they succumb to that seduction. But also, you can get caught in the the the, the thrill of the of the of, of the industry itself. You know, sort of these things are happening, and this is really exciting. And um, well, maybe we ought to let this occur because this this looks very exciting for the future and the like. And they're, they're the sort of problems that you can get into in, in, in terms of regulatory capture. How do we how do we bring them to account? Well, um, there are a few areas. The ANAO will do it. The National Audit Office will do it. Um, Sent estimates will do it. Um, you know, House of Representatives committees will do it. Parliamentarians will do it and the media will do it. Uh, and you know, if you can pass all those tests, then you, you're pretty good. Um, uh, you know, you, 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 you've dealt with it properly, but the pressure is there all the time, you know, and sometimes you'll get parliamentary pressure. <clears throat> I remember um, at a time when we were looking at the, the two big supermarket chains, Woolworths and Coles, and there was a lot of parliamentary pressure from particular parts of, of, of government to say, but hold on, these are big um, you know, gorillas and they ought to be constrained and that you ought to be helping you know, the independent operator that's out here on the side. And you know, I took a strong view that that was misplaced, that there were some, some vested interests that were pushing those sorts of issues. Now, yeah, that, that's where, you know, if you're not careful, parliament, parliamentarians can push you into a position of capture that, again, um, impugns the integrity of the organisation and impugns the, the, the sole pursuit of the public interest, which is really what you've got to be focusing on. Peter. Yeah, and I agree. Well, to take my tech, for example, um, you know, there was a danger then with that pushback from the sector that Texa could have then been actually, if you like, captured by the sector and now would be a toothless tiger. Now, in my strong view that and I see it from the university's point of view, you know, that isn't the case. It still plays that role. What it was able to do, and I suppose this is what all regulators need to do in a way, is to say this medicine is good for you. Uh, to actually get the sector to understand there are genuine advantages to the sector into the regulatory oversight that is being applied. But I think it is absolutely crucial in any organisation, any regulatory organisation, to try and get this balance. You want to be understood by the sector, you want to be under, you want to educate and market and communicate with those you're regulating, but you don't want to be captured by them. And in fact, my view is exactly the same um, on this, that, you know, that means you take a really, really tough line on, you know, gifts and functions and so on. You, you know, you need to say, uh, you know, uh, I want to, I have a role for you here. I am the regulator, but I am not your friend. And that's that's just two quick comments there, Fran. The first was that if I got invited to lunches as chairman of the ACCC or or the like, I said, yeah, if what you want me to come and do is address the gathered group about what the ACCC is doing, what its priorities are, how we'll administer the act, I'll come. If I'm coming just to be entertained, I'm off the list. Don't don't invite me. Actually, there was one particular CEO who got very irritable about this. And he said, look, Graham, you've rejected five invitations I've sent to you. What do you think I'm going to do? Corrupt you? And I said, no, but you have a damn good try. Um, so so that was that's that's part of the process. It's part of part of, um, yeah, just of being being very, very careful about those sorts of issues. I, I used to have a blanket rule. I accepted no invitations. It had a side benefit that it meant I never, ever had to go to the football. Um, uh, and the uh, the only thing I would add to your both of your wise words on this subject is, uh, as a former regulator, I felt that there were about 40 bodies who were constantly keeping an eye on my decision in one way or another. So um, uh, uh, there, there is a lot of regulation of the regulators that does occur, uh, although rarely put in one place, um, which can um, mean for jousting points of view, 
about good regulatory decisions. Now we've got time for one question if you two are both very, very speedy, 30 second answers, but I think this is a really great question, um, which was, does a lack of objective measures of success, i.e. what makes a good regulator, restrict how we're able to discuss um, a discussion around the minimising of the risk of failure? Yeah, so in my role now as at least a partial regulator, responsible for uh, accreditation of schools, registration of teachers in New South Wales. Uh, my view is, you know, what I start from the question, what would a well regulated sector look like? What am I seeking to do? Where, and then once I can do that, well, what are the problems I need to, to address that? And then some of that may be through the regulation itself, but some of it may be through uh, the communication and education uh, that I need to undertake. Yeah, and Graham? Quantitative KPIs are very dangerous uh, because they lead you to take actions that you shouldn't necessarily take in the best interest of being an effective regulator. Qualitative KPIs um, can be useful, sort of, if you like, statements of expectation, but again, a bit dangerous. Um, frankly, I regard um, a, a good regulator as a bit like a hippopotamus. You sure know one when you see one, but they're darn difficult to describe. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. And the final slide has just gone up, which is a bit like someone turning the lights out at a restaurant. Um, uh, because, of course, we had so much to say. So thank you, Peter and Graham. Thank you to the audience.